Okay, I think it's two o'clock. It's two o'clock on uh, on my computer, and I hear the two o'clock where I'm there. So I think we can start the webinar. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you to this uh, webinar, which is dedicated to European offshore renewable energy towards a sustainable future. And uh, I am Gilles Loricole, I am the present chair of the European Marine Board. And as you can see on this slide, on the bottom right corner, there is a possibility of the tweet. So you, you, can, you can tweet if you want about the event. So we can go to the housekeeping rules. Um, so uh, please make sure that your name is cl clearly entered. So when we will ask you or when you ask a questions, we will know wh who you are. And I think this is, this is important. To ask questions uh, during the discussion, uh, use the Q&A button on, on, on the bottom of the, on the, of the Zoom and uh, let us know uh, which organization and country you, you are from. Um, discussion uh, will, uh, will be done by uh, the moderator and uh, he will uh, select questions to, to be addressed. Uh, if you have any problem with the, the Zoom, there is a Zoom support and for that use a chat. And uh, to that you have probably seen already, the webinar is being recorded and uh, it will be made available on the European Marine Board website or on the, the European Marine Board uh, YouTube uh, channel. So let's go to, to the agenda. They, today we will have the, uh, so the welcome and opening, you, you have seen that already. Then uh, we will have a presentation of the document and especially its recommendation. And uh, this presentation of the document we will done by the working group chair and uh, by, by, uh, co-chair. So the chair is Tagvor Sukizian from uh, ICMR in Greece and uh, by uh, the co-chair and uh, I'm sorry about pronouncing the name. The French are very bad in using them. So I think it's uh, Annie Maria Ogagan from UCC Ireland. So the pronunciation in Irish is quite complicated for us French and I'm sorry about that. Then uh, to, to have um, an answer and a response on the documents by the European Commission's Felix Leinemann from the Unit A2 on the Blue Economy Sectors, Aquaculture and Maritime Special Planning from the GG Mari will, will uh, give this response. And then we will have uh, also a response by the industry. And this uh, Rémi Gruet, uh, who is a CEO of the Ocean Energy Europe. After that, we will have time for discussion and questions. Uh, this will... Uh, be able by, by from the audience and our mo moderator today is a Sheila Emans, which is the EMB executive director, the European Marine Board executive uh, director. So uh, the discussion participants will be all the working group members from the this uh, um, EMB offshore renewable energy. And and uh, unfortunately for you, I will uh, try to give the closing words. So uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, today uh, it's a, uh, the launch of our um, new EMB uh, Future Science Brief. It's uh, dedicated to offshore uh, urinable energy. As you can see on the slide, the complete title is uh, European Offshore Renewable Energy to, Towards a Sustainable Future. Uh, I think it's an important topic. It's a timely topic. It's especially to address uh, uh, this topic is important to help the European uh, to meet uh, its ambition targets, especially to, for, to reach decarbonization and renewable energy expansion for 2030 and 2050. It's, uh, I think, also relevant uh, for global ambition, such as the Paris Agreement. Uh, and uh, I would like to, to recall that in mid-March, we had the synthesis of the six IPCC report, 
we show that we really need to go for renewable energy and the place of uh, ocean is important and offshore renewable energy will uh, make uh, uh, probably a big difference. Uh, we already have addressed these topics more than 10 years ago, exactly in 2010. And uh, we think, we thought, sorry, it was time to revisit this topic, especially due to the rapid changes we have seen in the sector since uh, 2010. And uh, there's a lot of innovation who has been uh, raised up and uh, there's many major type of devices. And uh, for example, and uh, we have a, a newly, we have some, and I will say a lot of device who have been implanted and installed in, in offshore uh, today, not really in France, but in Europe for sure. Um, I think, it's uh, we thought the European Marine Board, European Marine Board, sorry, it's relevant to have a document that considers the diversity and of different ways of uh, extracting energy from the oceans. It's also relevant, uh, I believe, to have a document that consider the new technology, the policy, the environmental, and the socio-economic aspect. Uh, because a sector uh, cannot be sustainably and equitably developed and expanded if we continue to work in silos. For this, this document will discuss is discussing, sorry, offshore renewable energy development across all European sea basin, because if the targets are to be met, then offshore renewable energy devices need to be installed in all these different sea basins. However, the situations in the sea basins are different. So a solution that suits one area will not particularly suit another area. So we study in different sea basins the offshore renewable energy, and this is in this uh, document and it will be presented soon. So we can go to the next slide. Here on this slide, you, you can see some information about the working group that produced this document. Uh, this working group was selected to ensure the diversity in geographic location and background to be able to address these diverse needs. Uh, they uh, will say European Mine Board, Management Board, are very grateful to this working group and to the members and uh, especially under the leadership of the chair and the co-chair for all the work they have done in producing this valuable publication. And we are very happy to have the chair and the co-chair to uh, present uh, the, the, these documents and the members of the working group for, for the discussions. Uh, many of them are present today for the se seminar and uh, they will participate to the discussion session later. Next slide, please. Um, we would be happy at the European Mine Board to note that we are also being involved in other sorry, initiatives uh, relating to offshore renewable energy, of course. And uh, we are engaged in a project which is co-funded by the European Union, which is called Flores. This project has started in January uh, uh, this year, and uh, it focuses on addressing training and capacity needs linked to the offshore renewable energy industry. Uh, we want to notice also the pact for skills for offshore renewable energy, which is uh, uh, similarly focused on skills needs for the sector and uh, is open to other parties who would be interested to, to join. You can find out more uh, above these activities on uh, the EMB website and all, 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 all of our activity and organization, of course. And I recommend you to visit the, the website where you will find a lot of um, information. Um, if we go to the ne next slide. So fortunately, I'm for you, I will stop speaking and it's time to hear more about the document, which is the important 
think we were launching today. Uh, it will be presented by the chair and co-chair of the European uh, Marine Ball Working Group for this uh, uh, offshore renewable uh, energy. So uh, Tagvor uh, Sukishen is the chair, I've said already, and he is based in uh, 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 HCMR uh, in Greece. And uh, Anna Maria uh, Ogagan is a co-chair, and she is based at the Marais Center at the University College of Cork in Ireland. So now I will give the floor to them for for their presentation. So we will start by Tagvor. So Tagvor, uh, the 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 floor the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jill. I will. Share my screen now. It's okay. Can you see? Yeah, perfect. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Takvor Sukisian, and I'm chair of uh, this working group together with Anne Marie Hagan. I would like to welcome you in this uh, webinar for the presentation of the future science brief regarding European offshore renewable energy. As the progress and advances of offshore renewable energy, especially in the Northern European seas is very fast, I, I believe that within the next five years, a new report should be prepared. For example, uh, within the last three years, a lot of changes has happened in the Mediterranean, for example. There is one operational offshore wind farm in Italy, there are two pilot projects in France under development, while Greece and Spain are preparing the ground for their first uh, offshore wind farms installations. Uh, this future uh, science brief comes to a very crucial moment. We are all aware of the recent geopolitical and economic issues that have been caused from the war in Ukraine. We are also aware of the urgent climate change issues and EU policies related to them. Today, energy security proved to be of most importance, while the average European citizen is now much more concerned about environmental aspects and especially about climate change. Before proceed to the next slide, I would like here to thank all the people that was involved in this uh, mission. Uh, the working group, the additional contributors, the external reviewers, the series editor, Sheila, and the publication editors. And allow me to uh, give a great thanks to Paula Kellett. Uh, she was the heart of this group. Uh, in this report, we examine several topics, climate change aspects, a review on the status of offshore renewable energy at the global and the European levels, and then the critical aspects of the environmental and socioeconomic impacts from offshore renewable energy. Probably the most interesting parts of this document refer to the knowledge and capacity gaps, as well as issues related to policy, governance, and research recommendations. The relations between climate change and offshore renewable energy have been studied in a bi-directional way. First, we considered the positive effects of offshore renewable energy extraction on the mitigation of climate change impacts. And then we have assessed the ways that climate change affects offshore renewable energy production. The diagram in the slide uh, just quantifies what we all already know. The global anthropogenic emissions still exhibit an increasing trend in relation to the most important uh, groups of uh, greenhouse gases, namely the uh, F gases, the nitrous oxide, methane, and CO2. The positive effects of offshore renewable energy extraction on the fight against climate change are clearly shown in this table, where we can see that the equivalent grams of CO2 emitted per kilowatt hours from the use of fossil fuels is one up to three orders of magnitude greater than the equivalent grams of CO2 from offshore and offshore renewables. Although some figures of this table may decrease in the future, 
due to technological and manufacturing processes advancements of the ore industry, it is quite clear that renewables have a much smaller environmental effect in terms of CO2 emissions when compared to fossil fuels. The ways that climate change influence the production of offshore renewables is a complicated issue. We tried to assess several different aspects, namely, the expected climate change impacts on uh, renewable energy technical potential vary by region and climate change scenario considered. Therefore, it is subject to uncertainties. The long-term energy produced by offshore renewable energy extraction depends on the variability of the local meteorological and oceanographic conditions, which in turn are affected by climate change. Global warming also causes sea level rise, increasing in this way coastal water depths, tidal elevations, and wave heights. All this may have important impacts on the design of renewable energy devices, the moorings, anchorings, as well as their foundations. The information on extreme event probability and magnitude under different climate change scenarios is also very important for the design, installation, operation, and maintenance of these devices. If extreme weather events become more severe and frequent in the future, this will reduce maintenance opportunities. In addition, structural issues such as fatigue damage are sensitive to these changes, and so renewable energy devices might require more maintenance as weather becomes more severe. On the other hand, extreme weather events may also cause issues in the balance of electricity loads, installation of the power devices, and so on. Climate change will also have consequences on maritime spatial planning and potentially ocean zoning, as well as some environmental impacts. For instance, species behavior may change as ocean warming forces species to move to other locations. This is already happening in the Mediterranean Sea with the invasion of the lionfish and the silver-cheeked toadfish. Another aspect to consider is biofouling, which creates an additional significant maintenance challenge for the offshore renewable energy devices. In this table, the state of the global offshore renewable energy is presented, focused on the technical economic point of view. The numbers in this table demonstrate the following. In the second column, the capacity factor is shown. Capacity factor is the ratio of the average absorbed power to the maximum power that an ORE device, an offshore renewable energy device, can produce. The third column shows the estimated annual energy production, technical potential in terawatt hours per year. And the fourth column shows the estimated levelized cost of electricity for different uh, offshore renewable energy types. LCOE is probably the most important technological economic variable in the offshore renewable industry, and is also a key factor for decision-making processes. We see in this table that offshore wind has a low LCOE, which is reduced in a fast pace. On the other hand, thermal gradient energy has the greatest global potential, the highest capacity factor combined with very low LCOE. Unfortunately, this type of energy is not yet so mature and ready for commercial applications. In this graph, we see the main EU pillars based on which offshore renewable energy should be further developed. Of course, we have the Green Deal and the Paris Agreement. We have also the MSFD, which includes the good environmental status, the ecosystem approach, and the marine protected areas. We have the two directives, birds and habitat directives, and we have the maritime spatial planning issues. It is a very difficult exercise to balance strict engineering and geotechnical requirements with environmental sustainability and socioeconomic aspects, especially for areas with multiple and often contradicting marine uses. Yet it is an exercise that has to be solved. In this map, 
The current status of offshore wind farms in the European seas is presented as of February 2023. The leaders in offshore wind are clearly the Northern European countries with the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark and Belgium being at the top countries in terms of total megawatts co connected. As I said before, in the Mediterranean, there is only one commercial offshore wind farm in Italy and some pylon projects under development in France. Regarding the maturity of offshore renewable energies, mature technologies are considered offshore wind, tidal current and range, and wave energy. The stars in each technology in the slide indicate the relative maturity of each technology in this group, in the corresponding group. At the pilot and demonstration phase, we have floating solar energy, on which the EU is focusing recently a lot. We have also salinity gradient, marine biomass, and power to X, where X can be hydrogen, methanol, ammonia, etc. There are, however, some barriers in the forcing development that should be overcome logistics, port facilities for the transportation of the devices and components in the implementation, in the installation place, and potential problems in the supply chain. Some positive perspectives of the offshore renewable energy industry refers to the expansion to key markets such as desalination, fish farming, small island developing states, uh, states, sorry, algae production, etc. I think now it's Anne Marie turn. Thank you, Tech4, and thank you to all the participants who are joining online today to listen to this lunch. Tech4 has already mentioned climate change and why we need ORE, and that has been strongly complemented at international level through the Framework Convention on Climate Change and also the Paris Agreement. But it's also been worked on very heavily and intensely at European level through the Renewable Energy Directive, which has been in place since 2009 and revised a few times since. At the moment, um, the amount of renewable energy in the EU's energy consumption by 2030 is set at 32%. And this is taken forward by member states through their individual national energy and climate plans. And an analysis of those plans say that those targets are achievable, but we do need to speed up. Since the Renewable Energy Directive, we've had other policy documents like the European Green Deal, which seeks to achieve carbon, a carbon neutral EU by 2050 through a secure energy supply, an integrated and interconnected EU electricity market or energy market, sorry, um, which the Green Deal also prioritizes energy efficiency and a power sector that is based on renewables. We've had an offshore renewable energy strategy more recently at that, which sets targets of 60 gigawatts of offshore wind and one gigawatt of ocean energy by 2030, rising to 300 gigawatts of offshore wind and 40 gigawatts of ocean energy by 2050. So they're not insignificant. Um, in order to accelerate those, the Commission and other European institutions have been working on plans to progress renewable offshore renewable energy through the RE Power EU plan. And just last week, last Friday, we saw a provisional agreement between the European Parliament and the Council to re reinforce the Euro European Renewable Energy Directive. And that agreement has risen the existing target of 32% to 42.5%. And negotiators have also agreed that the EU would aim to achieve 45% of renewables by 2030. And I think what is interesting about the developments last Friday is that renewable energy will be recognized as an overriding public interest, which was one of the grounds that um, applications could be challenged under in the Habitats Directive. So we're seeing this interplay between environmental objectives and energy objectives, and we really can't separate the two. Um, member states are being asked to put in place dedicated acceleration areas for renewables with particularly short and simple permitting processes in areas where there is high renewable energy resource potential, but um, low environmental risks. 
So if I could have the next slide, please, tag four. So in addition to the energy and climate policy area, we also have significant ambition in terms of the marine environment. The Marine Strategy Framework Directive, as Tech 4 mentioned, has been, place, has been in place since 2008, and it aims to achieve good environmental status of Europe's marine waters. So that's been actively implemented across Europe at the moment. But at international level and again at EU level, the policy is evolving. We have a new global biodiversity framework, which has 21 new targets and 10 milestones, one of which is to, is to conserve 30% of marine areas um, through protected areas or other effective area-based conservation measures by 2030. This has, I suppose, been complemented by the European Union's own biodiversity strategy, which has similar targets. As part of that package, we're seeing a proposed nature restoration law where member states would have to have restoration plans, again, that cover 20% of land and sea areas by 2030. So we can't separate our energy and climate targets from our biodiversity obligations as well. And really what this comes back to is a need to um, strengthen our systems, our planning systems and our management systems. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, one way in which this could be achieved is through the implementation of maritime spatial planning, which is designed to better manage the use of marine space to create synergies between different activities and deliver sustainable development um, across all maritime sectors. And I don't want to focus too much on maritime spatial planning today, but I think if we're to take away anything in relation to MSP, the two main areas for action are around the need to apply an ecosystem-based approach. We have lots of European research projects going on in that area, but it still remains a challenge at national level and more local levels to interpret what that actually means in practice. What does it look like? In addition, we need to promote the coexistence of relevant activities and uses. And sometimes that is easier to say than to do. Um, could I have the next slide, please? In terms of environmental impacts, the future brief presents the current level of knowledge on this, and it's a heavily re referenced chapter. Um, it also presents the kind of mitigation measures that are currently used to address some of these impacts. Um, the current level of knowledge indicates that all species, fish, marine mammals, invertebrates, seabirds, and benthic species can be affected by offshore renewable energy installations, but we do distinguish between an effect and an impact. An effect does not indicate a magnitude or significance, whereas an impact implicitly deals with levels of severity, intensity, or duration. So you need to bear that in mind when you're reading about environmental impacts and effects. Um, the short and long-term impacts on species and ecosystems can be positive and negative, and that's something that we need to focus on when we're assessing environmental um, assessments or impact assessments. Um, it is critical from what we know already that monitoring continues as more and more developments occur. And it's only through that that we will learn the effects and impacts at the ecosystem level, which is what a lot of our law and policy focuses on. Um, the current evidence base also suggests that monitoring should take place during all phases of development from initial planning phases through your environmental impact assessment right up to decommissioning when your project um, comes to the end of its life. Next slide, please. In the environmental impacts chapter, we also look at the lessons learned, particularly in relation to environmental monitoring. And what we've seen, I suppose, across Europe is that there's often a lack of baseline information in many locations. And the implication of that is we don't know then if an effect or an impact is related to a particular, for example, offshore energy development or whether it's related to some other stressor in the environment like climate change or a different type of activity. Um, the evidence to date suggests that monitoring should be species driven because that will help us to address existing knowledge gaps. 
post-consent monitoring is necessary where there's uncertainty. And this uncertainty can relate to scientific understanding. It can, relation, it can relate to the significance of an impact on a species or on a habitat. And it can also relate to the effectiveness of a proposed mitigation measure. So we're not saying that everything has to be monitored, but we need to focus on collecting data that helps us to better understand the significance of impacts on marine environments and species. And one thing we've learned that even though wind farms, for example, have been in place since the 1990s and environmental monitoring has been going on, there's been no consistency in the way that data has been collected. So that's made it much more difficult to establish key trends on impacts and effects. And we want to change that. And I suppose that's one of the key um, recommendations going forward is that we need to continue basic monitoring as well as individual species level monitoring. Um, we still don't know the appropriate time window for capturing short-term effects or long-term effects because that varies according to the different species we're talking about and the devices, but it's also dependent on the state of the ecosystems, which brings us back to that baseline condition. So we really need to follow up monitoring so that we can learn from each insula installation and be able to assess widespread effects in both space and time. Next slide, please. Chapter five of the future brief looks at socioeconomic impacts. And we've really tried to split this into the social impacts and the economic impacts. I think everyone will be familiar with what an economic impact is. Um, it, can be subdivided into direct economic impacts or indirect economic impacts. The direct, I suppose, impacts are most commonly jobs in the offshore renewable energy strategy produced by the Commission in 2020. Um, it stated that 62,000 people worked in offshore wind, and another study has said that that could rise up to 3.5 million people by 2040. So that brings in the indirect needs as well as the indirect benefits, because how are we going to train people to um, supply that new energy? Is there a need for new training programs, new infrastructure, new courses? Um, one of the things that comes up quite frequently when talking about the impacts of renewable energy development is what are the benefits to local communities, to local um, societies living around these large scale de developments. So in this chapter, we looked at community benefit schemes, tried to establish what they were. And what we see is that there's no standard approach and no, I suppose, standard requirement across the European Union on this. And the best practice research suggests that they have to be customized and tailored to the scale, the location, and the technology of the development taking place. Another thing that has come up is community ownership. That's relatively rare in an offshore context. We do have a working group on um, the offshore area within the European Federation of Citizen Energy Cooperatives, but we don't know where that work is going to go yet. So that's something to keep an eye on. In terms of social impacts, there's quite a lot of research around what exactly is a social impact. And basically what it relates to is how does a development affect a person, a group of people, or an entire community, either directly or indirectly. So in that sense, it can cover many, many things. There could be impacts on quality of life, like um, the historic environment, cultural heritage, tourism, and recreation opportunities. But there could also be impacts on health and well-being, like impacts associated with noise and vibration, increased in traffic. Um, there, we they change quite, I suppose, a lot over time. You could see that maybe initially people are against things and um, large developments, but over time their opinions change. So in order to establish social impacts, we really need long-term data. The degree to which socioeconomic impacts are included in consenting systems varies uh, by location. Obviously, they're taken in quite a bit by environmental impact assessment processes, but really EIA has been focused on physical characteristics and less so on social and economic impacts. So that's something that we also need to address. 
And really it comes down, I suppose, to better governance, which we'll come back to towards the end of the presentation. So I think it's back to you, Tech4. Yeah, thank you. Now, as regards the main knowledge and capacity gaps, uh, this refers to the following topics. First is grid connections. In this context, the European level connection should be further developed and new maritime spatial plans should necessarily include grid planning. Interconnection and direct connections to offshore wind farms is a rational step for the more efficient use of offshore wind resources. And for the future, the implementation of a multi-terminal and a fully meshed offshore grid, sometimes called super grid, are also foreseen. Regarding the stabilization of energy system, the improvement of short-term forecasts is crucial, together with the major issue of energy storage. Power to X and offshore storage are key assets in ensuring grid stability and efficient operation of the entire system. Cost reduction and sustainability includes many different aspects and relevant problems. There is a shortage of material supply globally and especially of critical minerals where geopolitical uncertainties and potentially monopolies are involved. Turning to the solution of deep sea mining, it raises many environmental and socioeconomic concerns. Reuse and or recyclability of composites and new materials is imperative, while economical and environmentally sustainable alternative protection measures regarding corrosion and biofouling are also needed. Full life cycle assessment refers to engineering, financial, and environmental aspects of the offshore renewable energy devices lifetime. First, the energy requirements of offshore renewable energy components should be estimated. Then the cumulative environmental effects should be quantified through environmental monitoring, as Anne-Marie said before, at all stages of an offshore renewable energy project. Environmental monitoring is a rather costly procedure, but should be implemented for future projects in order to have the overall picture of the environmental effects and impacts during the entire lifetime of the device and after its decommissioning. Data sharing is another hot and fragile issue. Companies are reluctant to share the data generated on the installation location of the offshore renewable energy device, and this is a rather common attitude by the industry. On the other hand, from the scientist's part, scientists are also usually reluctant to share raw data from published works. The initiatives of the EU in data sharing is extremely beneficial not only because of their direct availability, but also as a means to show a new and rational behavior as regards this issue. Regarding maritime spatial planning, the EU's directive requires planning cycles of 10 years maximum, during which changes in the environment, ocean governance, offshore renewable energy technology, society and economy, take place inevitably. The plans must therefore be sufficiently responsive to these changes while still delivering on the requirements of MSFD and considering also socioeconomic impact as aspects. It's your turn now, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Tag, for So we've cheated a little bit on the recommendation slide by giving you the broad areas, and that's designed uh, purposely to make you go and read the document. But in summary, I suppose the recommendations sit in three broad areas. So this afternoon's presentation will give you an idea that this huge policy variations within this entire renewable energy um, spectrum on marine environment, energy, planning, all of, all of those areas. And we really need to address where there's misalignment in policy. Otherwise we're going to end up in a situation where it's conservation versus development again. And we need to facilitate support for offshore renewable, renewable energy in light of often or sometimes uh, competing policy objectives at member state level and perhaps even at European level. 
In terms of research and technology, we've put forward 12 recommendations. There is considerable capacity across the EU in relation to different aspects of offshore renewable energy development, but some gaps remain in things like modeling capability and tools to predict um, extreme events. We also need to look at developing, I suppose, more robust frameworks for holistic environmental and socioeconomic studies and mitigation strategies for multiple devices or for cumulative impacts. Um, I suppose we should be looking at designing installations or developments that have um, implications for biodiversity, for positive biodiversity conservation, and how that works in practice at government, government level. And the third area where we make recommendations is the whole area of data and capacity. At the minute, there's in some locations, there's considerable difficulties in accessing consistent long-term data sets that can be rigorously interrogated by scientists to determine long-term impacts or effects. We also need to make better use of existing data and share new data. So we need systems in place at European level and transboundary contexts where we can really look at that information, determine what is the reality and design or redesign our systems around that. So that's all I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, Davor and uh, Anne-Marie. I prefer to say it uh, the French way, as it looks like a, a very French name, so it's more difficult to, to, to use it the, the way you use it, so sorry about that. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation uh, made at two voice and four hands, and uh, it's quite relevant, and we see that the recommendation uh, are, are important, especially there is a very important updating of what we, we where we are at the uh, renewable and uh, offshore energy. And uh, I would like to to ask now um, Felix uh, Leineman, which is who is uh, sorry who is the, from uh, the European Commission de Gemari, and uh, he's head of Unit A2 Blue Economy uh, Sectors. Aquaculture and uh, marine MSP. It's easier for me to, to say that from the Gimari, as I said. And uh, Felix, we would like to to hear from you if you have any uh, recommendations and especially response uh, about this this document. So, Felix, the floor is yours. Yeah, and and colleagues, thank you, thank you very much for for inviting me to this. Um, thank you also for giving me the opportunity to have a pre-read uh, before everybody else of the report. So it's a very comprehensive and impressive document, which I think comes at the, at the very right time. Um, and uh, I would like to give a bit of a uh, context, maybe first a bit of policy context, and then react to the recommendations and, and what I've uh, picked up from the report. Um, the report says it, we, we need offshore renewable energy for decarbonization of our energy system. And um, the, the target of 60 gigawatt of offshore wind by 2030 and one gigawatt of uh, ocean energy by 2030 uh, was already mentioned. In the meantime, with Repower EU, with Russia's war against Ukraine um, and the, the realization that we need uh, renewables also for our energy independence, um, the pledges from member states, um, what they want to achieve by 2030 in terms of um, offshore wind, now amount to 110 gigawatt, which is also almost double of what we envisaged in 2020, so just uh, two and a half years ago. Of course, this will need to be realized and to be done, but it's there. And um, member states have reflected their ambition for offshore wind in their maritime spatial plans. They have identified large areas at sea for offshore wind in their national plans after a consulta consultative and integrated process. And we see several member states who are actively fine-tuning their plans to align them with the most recent, recent um, national objectives. We see this acceleration everywhere. And, and um, Anne-Marie also, um, also mentioned um, the uh, objective of having 
5% um, of renewables in the final energy consumption um, at the end. So we need all sources of renewables to increase our energy security and the transition to a carbon-free economy. And we have good natural resources and the ability to harvest energy also from waves and tides, which is predictable and complementary to wind and solar. But of course, we cannot address the objectives for renewable energy in isolation. We will need to share the space. Um, we will need to look at multi-use and we need to act concretely to tackle biodiversity loss, nature restoration and the protection of the marine environment. And we also need food from the ocean. So we are seeing that there are new practices of sharing the sea um, that are taking up with pilot projects on multi-use that are funded either by the commission or member states. And they touch on the protection of the marine environment, on fisheries, on aquaculture or tourism. We see that some offshore wind developers are also actively investigating mitigation and restoration measures. We see, a, for example, also from the side of member state administrations, a growing trend of including so-called non-price criteria uh, related to the marine environment in the offshore wind auctions, which could accelerate the learning curve that we have in, in this kind of um, multi-use and to help us scale up practices. So, if you want to identify further areas for multi-use, we of course need more sea basin cooperation and sharing practices that we as the European Commission want to um, support. As we see that offshore wind is now being planned in all sea basins and in member states with an important fishing activity, um, there's obviously a need for uh, a dialogue with the fisheries sector and that need for the dialogue will increase substantially. If we look at the recent analysis by Wind Europe, the space that has been allocated in national maritime spatial plans to offshore wind would be sufficient to produce 220 gigawatt by 2040. Overall, that's an average of 2.9% of the maritime space. But of course, in certain areas, in certain sea basins, in countries with a smaller uh, economic uh, zone, like Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, those percentages are going uh, are far higher. And we as the Dimara have been looking recently at the impacts of offshore wind on fisheries and aquaculture. The report mentions also um, the question of, um, sorry, of data. And um, what we see is also that uh, seven member states have already uploaded data from their maritime spatial plans in EMODNET, the U European Marine Observation and Data Network. And we encourage other member states to do the same. Because this allows actually the public to see um, the developments and what is planned, not just at national level, but also at a sea basin um, level. In order to facilitate discussions between different users, we are also going to launch the Blue Forum for Sea Users um, on the 26th of May, just one day after European Maritime Day and also in, in Brest this year. With that, I just wanted to give you also a, a policy background of what, what uh, is happening from, from a policy side. I've read the report with interest and would also like to comment a little bit on the um, valuable recommendations that come out and um, what is there. I noted, for example, the uh, chapter five, which looks at the socioeconomic impacts um, and that they that shows how these are considered in existing decision-making processes, how new approaches and concepts might assist in helping these. We are looking at, for example, communities of practice that uh, discuss with all the participants how you can make things uh, work better, how you can work better together. So this uh, socioeconomic element is quite interested. The report also looks at how socioeconomics are currently included in decision-making processes and how you can actually get a social license to operate. I find that very interesting. If I may just add one remark, it is interesting that fisheries don't actually show up in the socioeconomic, but then in the section a bit later where um, the report refers to spatial conflicts, so not necessarily socioeconomic, but of course the space and the societal elements uh, are very close together. Another element is um, the climate change impacts, which will have uh, uh, consequences for maritime spatial planning and potentially ocean zoning, and also the environmental 
impacts where species and effects may change when ocean warming forces species to move to other areas. We are seeing now a movement towards something called climate smart MSP, climate smart maritime spatial planning, looking and anticipating these developments also in the maritime spatial plans. Um, it may not be in the current generation of maritime spatial plans, but we hope to see this also in the future and to work and to help the work uh, developing of this. There's also a mention of the, sorry, uh, of basin-wide cumulative effects. That's very ambitious and difficult because a single country cannot do it. There's close collaboration between scientists and administrators across country borders. Um, we have uh, set up the, in EMOTnet, I already mentioned EMOTnet for MSP, but there are also other uh, dedicated information exchange mechanisms. And we have funded a couple of um, projects from the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund um, on cross-border maritime spatial planning in the past, and we will continue to do that. We also see uh, Horizon Europe projects, uh, for example, MSP for Bio or another one, where they look actually at these effects across a whole sea basin. Another observation is the question of uh, sustained funding for ocean observation and ma marine monitoring and the lack of that, so that there is a lack of baseline knowledge that was mentioned in your presentation as well. This definitely needs to be uh, addressed. And as you may know, we are working on an ocean observation initiative, form yet to be determined, in order to render ocean observation in Europe more effective, more targeted, and more coordinated between different um, member states. Um, the report also mentions the need for a strategy for data compilation and management in the context of maritime spatial planning. Actually, the cross-border projects that we have funded over the years, they have also brought together data experts. And we have, in, in this context, a, a group of volunteers of data experts in maritime spatial planning is gathering regularly. It's a technical expert group, data for MSP, that has been created um, and is supported through the European um, MSP platform and that wants to continue working on this. They actually are also behind making it possible of uploading the plans in EMOTnet, no matter in which um, data format they have been um, prepared. Let me give two more comments, maybe, or three. Um, the report also encourages transdisciplinary cooperation, including between policy and decision makers to collaborate with uh, scientists. I would invite the European Marine Board to participate in the Blue Forum uh, for sea users. We um, will launch a call for taking part in it, uh, probably in the week after Easter. So you're very welcome to join and uh, very welcome to note in your agendas the, the first event, the launch event, but then also to take part in, in future exercises that we have in this uh, Blue Forum. Um, your input, and in terms of researching how to establish and integrate cultural aspects into environmental impact assessments and strategic impact assessments um, and socioeconomic costs, those uh, elements can also be very important as input to the Blue Forum and uh, the way it will work. I also noted with interest the part, um, which may be more for industry, but which we are also interested in, the question of researching uh, new materials that allow for reuse, recyclability, and corrosion prevention. Um, of course, the question is, if we build 20,000 um, offshore wind turbines out there, do we really want to build all this with steel and concrete? Or do we can we, over time, develop other materials that produce energy in an in a even less um, resource-absorbing way? So with that, I don't want to take too much time. So I, I would like to thank you very much once again. And we will look, of course, in detail in the further recommendations with great interest and see how we can take this up further. Thank you. Back to you, G. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you very much for this uh, recommendation and, and uh, comments on, uh, on, on, this, uh, on this document. Uh, we will take uh, home a lot of, of your message and a uh, try to, to to be part of the Blue Forum, as you said, which is a, something uh, we believe also that it's important. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, I don't want also to take all, most of the time. And I will now invite uh, Rémi Gruet, 
who is the uh, chief executive officer of the Ocean Energy ne Europe Network, sorry, to, to give also his comment, respond and recommendation on, on the document. So Remy, uh, the, the, floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, to the mind board for inviting us. So Ocean Energy Europe, like you mentioned, is a, an association representing the ocean energy sector. So we, we don't do offshore wind or offshore solar, but we do tidal wave, uh, salinity gradient, ocean thermal exchange, and even tidal range. Uh, so we, we are a mix of academy uh, of industry, academia, supply chain companies, and also regions. Uh, and uh, quite a few of our members, uh, namely Fremer, UCC, Wevec, SEI, to name a few, have, have participated in the report. So very happy to see uh, a few uh, well-known names there, and, and Marie not being the only one. So I'll, I'll, I'll focus on to um, my comments on the main body of the report and then on the recommendations. Um, obviously, it's it's, good, it's great to have a, a, a new report on, on offshore renewables. I think it's, it's well needed. I'm very happy to see in the main body on the potential side to see figures uh, that are fairly significant, uh, figures that we've pushed as well ourselves. Very significant for WAVE, uh, a bit less for TIDAL, but very focused in specific areas. So from that perspective, also interesting. Um, a lot of mention of theoretical potential, uh, which is, I mean, just for WAVE, for example, is, is about 10 times uh, the annual EU consumption of electricity. So very significant. Well. Obviously, practical potential is uh, is much lower. Uh, the things we can really exploit with current state of technology is around 10% of new electricity for for both uh, tidal and wave. But nonetheless, very significant. It's uh, it's about half uh, half what coal produces at the moment in EU. It's about the same amount than hydroelectricity. So uh, very good on that. Um, on the technology. There is a strong focus on tidal stream at present. Uh, I think your, your document reflects that as well. Uh, we're putting machines in the water. Tidal range has um, not delivered any projects recently. And there used to be a few at, at the moment. There's are still a bit uh, waiting for, for, for future support, maybe. Tidal stream, on the other hand, uh, has is benefiting in Europe and outside of Europe as well from uh, stronger support in the last two years. Uh, after a dry spell of, of about five years, I want to say. Uh, for WAVE, I, I think maybe one, one comment on the document. I think you're missing two technologies, at least I haven't seen them. The rotating mass um, and the flaps. The flaps, there is a picture of AW Energy, which is, but I don't think it's mentioned in the text too much or in, in the main main technologies. Uh, and, and maybe it's Maybe it's worth letting go now of this overtopping concept. Uh, it's it's a concept that we haven't had anybody represent in the last ten years of um, that I've been here at Ocean Energy Europe, and nobody's been has been pushing that concept particularly. It's it's a wave concept that was developed in the, in the two thousands. Uh, so maybe something that uh, is drawn from past literature and and, and could be updated. But, but essentially, this is where we are. Tidal very much. At pilot farm stage, wave at prototype stage. And then moving to policy, I think there is a great coverage of all maritime related initiative. Um, it was very clear also in the presentation. It's great to have the targets of the offshore renewable strategy being um, named again. Um, yeah, Anne-Marie mentioned during the presentation and maybe that can be reflected uh, also in the report uh, a bit further is uh, the renewable energy directive, the impact it's had on the development of renewables offshore and, and offshore, uh, onshore and offshore has been very significant. And the revision last week is also significant, not least because the parliament had proposed a target for innovative renewables of 5% of future installed capacity. So any megawatts put in the ground or in the sea between now and 2030, 5% of that should be innovative technologies. So it's good for a number of technologies, not only uh, ocean or offshore technologies, but uh, floating wind comes to mind, obviously tidal wave and, and all the other ocean uh, are fit that description. Uh, good to see also on the wider socioeconomic benefits, a very, very clear account uh, of numerous benefits from offshore renewables being built indigenously. Uh, Felix mentioned it, uh, it's one of the priorities at the moment for any member states to have indigenous, not only an indigenous resource, but also an indigenous means of producing uh, the extracting means to, 
to, to get that resource. Uh, and this is something where offshore renewables are, are very strong in. It's very locally built. To give you an example, Nova Innovation, who built in the Shetland, managed to achieve uh, about 100% UK content and 50% Shetland content. I mean, the Shetlands are a very small group of islands with very little infrastructure, and despite that, it's possible to, to do things there. So very good there. Um, it's very visible on offshore wind. Ocean energies have the exact same business model of offshore wind. It's it's sub it's foundations, it's nacelles, um, it's blades, it's steel, it's electronic equipment. Uh, it's the exact same business model. So uh, I have uh, no doubt that the same cost reductions and community benefits will, will be delivered. So in conclusion on the, on the main body of the report, I think it's great, it's good overview of the state of play across several angles. Obviously, it's very difficult to cover all the angles. So um, maybe my, my only comment would be to, it's difficult to rely on the literature for innovative and fast moving sectors. So maybe some of the references to 2011 or 2013 studies um, should be dropped in favor of more, more recent, uh, more recent studies or, or, or simply just a, you know, a few, a few phone calls uh, to, to the industry. But it's, it's great to, to see that you have very clearly had a number of people who know the sector very well, uh, part of the working group and, and deliver this uh, this text. So going to the recommendation now, you're going across policy, research, technology, and data and capacity as shown by Anne-Marie. Uh, data and I'll start in the exact opposite order uh, because last but not least, right? So on, on data and capacity for us, we've, we've been partnership, partnering with Copernicus Marine Service and the data um, they're producing is very useful for us for siting, for production assessment, for offshore operations. The main feedback we've had for the industry is exactly what you have in the report is the need for higher resolution. So um, essentially to have the best definition possible, the smallest possible survey area, because if you put a tidal turbine in one area, or if you put it 50 meters away, it's going to produce different amounts of electricity. So for us, uh, we will always need in-situ studies. Uh, as is rightly pointed out as well, uh, but uh, that higher resolution is, is very useful. Now on research and technology, I think uh, you're highlighting a, a lot of good options for continuing research and building up the body of, uh, of information we have. Uh, specifically to mention a few, uh, very happy to see the mention of positive alongside negative environmental impacts. They are often forgotten. Uh, so you often end up with studies who just look at one, one aspect, um, also to see that climate change is included in the positives, which often isn't the case. Like, we clearly, these technologies are solutions for climate change, but that, pos that positive impact is actually forgotten when you look at uh, localized impacts sometimes. Uh, the way rules have and measures have worked or not worked is very important for decision making. Um, also, like the designing or installation as uh, artificial reefs or more generally, other effective conservation measures, uh, as, as they are called, uh, something that we had promoted uh, and, yeah, which has been worked on by a number of industrials, but not quite as much as it could uh, probably in the future. Uh, factors influencing CapEx, anyway, there, there are a lot of good uh, research options that you're highlighting. My, my main comment on that would be that um, Representing, I, I worked as, I worked in wind before, and, and representing now technologies that are more innovative. I think there is a need for differentiation of requirements and also differentiation of research recommendations uh, between commercial technologies on one side and emerging technologies on the other. Um, when it comes to actually installing the machines, obviously having the same burden for a one gigawatt wind farm. Uh, and having, and as well as for a three megawatt tidal farm with two or three devices, doesn't make a lot of sense. And also, the amount of information we need to continue to develop tidal and wave at present is probably not quite as high as the amount of information uh, you might want further down the line once we have 100 megawatt, uh, one gigawatt, or, or 40 gigawatt as the offshore strategy recommends in the water. So, that's for us, it's really a key requirement is to, uh, to have some. Yeah, some, some consistency in um, not, not asking very small projects uh, to have very large um, data gathering requirements, um, for example. Voilà. And then finally, to move to policy, I think um, 
the key aspect for us, obviously, we, we are a policy interested uh, party. And I was, yeah, I picked two, and the last one's the most important. But um, I was interested in the recommendation around addressing misalignment within policy, uh, which counters the development. I'm just reading it out loud uh, the development of cost efficiency delivery of our, our, uh, offshore renewables, including compromise with other sectors, third market intervention, competing policy objectives. We've seen quite a lot of that. To give you one example, uh, the stated guidelines had been in the past uh, an issue for delivering uh, offshore renewable projects it has been worked on and to a certain extent the um, repower eu has, has helped there i think there is a change of heart uh, and there are a number of uh, of parties within within the european institution not least the jimari and, and felix Leinemann and, and his team who have helped us pass those messages and essentially try and lower uh, the challenges and the hindrances that some of these existing technologies which are there for good reasons but being applied to innovative projects um, created issues for the sector. And the final one is around creating financing solutions. I don't think anybody in the sector is going to be surprised by that. So you have a recommendation on creating financing solutions uh, to support the scale up of ORA and its uh, technology readiness level. So like I said, um, title is at pilot farm stage. We're, we're planning right now the second uh, generation of pilot farms. A wave has mostly prototypes in the water. Uh, some companies are looking at pilot farms, but the key word for us is deployment. We need more machines in the water to be able to progress the sector. Uh, it's a sector that has largely, between COVID and uh, some lack of support at national level, been waiting for finance to be available. The current priorities of RS in Europe are well aligned with this. We finally have calls for pilot farms to be put in the water. Uh, the deadline was last week for the tidal side, and we have one uh, early next year for WAVE as well. And I, I want to finish on that because we, without this finance for deployment, uh, we're going to lose all the research that we've invested in those sectors. The US and China have been very clear in the last few years in their support uh, for tidal and WAVE. The US has been investing over the last five years over 100 million per year in those technologies. And China has just included the, quote, large-scale deployment of ocean energies in its 14th five-year plan. And if you know China, this means that this is going to get delivered and it's going to go fast. So five years is maybe what Europe still has if it wants to deploy these technologies and not get beaten by its uh, international competitors however good that might be for uh, the environment and the climate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Remy. Thank you very much. Fortunately, we have been uh, recording all your comments and uh, recommendations, so we will get, be able to come back to uh, all a uh, long list of uh, important uh, words you have said. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, especially sorry for the the old, uh, all, all the, um references and uh, you know old people they all have their old references and uh, i take i take the message because uh, also about the very high resolution that is needed has been working for more than 20 years as a marine geologist in very high resolution mm -hmm. seismic for rig uh, assessment especially site survey also and yeah. we always asking for more precise more higher, higher resolutions, because mm -hmm. of course, if we want to know the things, we need to really go to to the fractal, to, to, to the lowest, uh, resol the highest resolution we can have. Okay, thank you very much for all of these. Uh, it's, it was nice to have the, the European Commission with the DigiMari and the vision of the a network of, uh, of I will say, uh, uh, people, industry people who are uh, working on the uh, ocean energy and uh, as the Ocean Energy uh, Europe Network. Thank you, Remy. And, Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> and now we, we got some time to, for question and, and, and discussions. Uh, so I think there we have already uh, we have already some questions in in the Q and A. So if you have other questions of comment uh, coming from now, please uh, ask uh, ask your question using the the Q and A functions. Uh, I invite also the the working group members to turn on their cameras. 
so they will be able to to, to give an answer. And now I will uh, uh, hand you over to the discussion moderator, which is uh, Sheila Sheila Heimage, Heimage, sorry Sheila, uh, which is the, our uh, I will say most famous executive director of the European Marine Board and uh, working with the very important secretary who have organized this. So now, uh, Sheila, I'd like to moderate and go through the questions. I know there is already one or two in the Q&A. So Sheila, it's, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, can you guys hear me OK? Yeah, yeah perfectly. Okay. All right, perfect. OK, so thank you very much. Um, I don't know, uh, maybe we can yeah, maybe we can take turn the that's it. Take the take the thing off. Um, so um, hi everybody. Nice to uh, see all the working group members. Thank you very much for a wonderful document. It's ha actually been a, an amazing document to to read. Um, and there were some questions, but uh, <laughs> the working group members have answered them in the meantime. So I will I will just say that there were some questions about the the table that um, Takfor pr uh, produced about the um value of 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 the lc lcoe values for wave energy and then he came back and said that he thought that they were actually correct so i attack i don't know if you wanted to respond to that at all or uh, yeah uh, i answered privately to the uh to, to the he, he who asked and uh, as we know from the literature there is a, a large dispersion of the lcoe values especially as regards wave energy there is uh, a difference of one or two orders of magnitude between, between different wave energy converters. So this is just an average value, and uh, uh, the deviation is uh, is very large between different uh, energy converters. This was my answer. However, I will check it again. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure. I, I think somebody else also responded that they thought that that was right, and and maybe the question because uh, I think Remy mentioned the fact that you know, for some of these things, they only have about a 10%. So there's the, there's, there's what, what you think, you know, what, the, what is there, but what you can actually uh, get to um, with the technology you have it, is, it was about 10%. So maybe that is where the, 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 the difference came in. I don't know if that was the case, but. I do have another question from Denis Lacroix. Um, and he asks, what about the potential of artificial reefs in ORE parks um, as it's used successfully for fisheries involvement in Japan for de decades? And do you think that spe specific experiments would be useful? I don't know who wants to take that question. Um, I, I, I see Beth is there and I feel like she should, <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna think, point the finger at you there, Beth, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I'll take, take that. It's not exactly my, my specialty, but, but we'll, we'll take that. Uh, yes, in the Southern North Sea, absolutely. A lot of the developments uh, are looking at artificial reefs. Um, where there were reefs before, there should be reefs again. Where there weren't reefs before, it's a question of whether you know we should be putting in habitat into areas um, where there wasn't anything like that before. So um, there, of course, there's a potential and um, people are looking at this. And there's been a lot of work also at SAMS, the um, uh, Scottish um, Marine Group over in Oban at artificial reefs. They've had one down, I think, for almost 20 years now, looking at all the different shapes and sizes and what, what makes the most productive reefs. So it is a tool in the armament, but it's not the complete answer. Yeah. Thanks. And and Dixon, I see you have your, I'm sorry, Dixon, I see you, you have your name, uh, your hand up as well. Hi, Sheila. Just to add to what Beth is saying, um, there's work going on in the Insight program uh, in the, in, at the moment, looking at far field effects of, of fisheries aggregations on um, structures. Um, and that's being carried through a little bit in the Eco Wind program as well. Um, and what they're finding is that the fish aggregation isn't just within the structure itself, but it's also kilometres, sometimes tens of kilometres away. Um, when you're looking at fisheries and offshore wind, there's two components to it there's the biodiversity component and and what that does for fish stocks and then there's the operational component of what fishermen can actually do within wind farms which often comes down to health and safety and navigational requirements so you can't it's not it's not always as simple as saying um these these 
let's have coexistence there are lots of different things that feed into that but um yeah there is really good evidence showing that um structures do generate increases in biodiversity which can have impacts on fish stocks so, yeah. yeah yeah thanks and I, maybe i'll follow on from that because because i was kind of thinking about well two things that are not quite related but but anyway the one is basically indeed um, there is multiple. There is a, definitely a push and a, a need to to mold, to use space in different ways. You can't. We just we don't have the space in Europe to um, to to put all all the uses separately. You know, marine spatial planning, especially for instance the North Sea, is just you're going to have to do things together. And I'm not sure how much there is work. In the in the industry to to put different types of renewable energy um, extraction methods in one place, and I don't know if that's something that maybe could be worked on. I don't know how much you. I know in the document we talked about multiple use, but whether that was something that we highlighted at all, um, I don't remember that. So that's one one question, and I don't know if anybody wants to answer that. But that was something I thought about, um, and then the other question escapes me at the moment. <laughs> so. Sheila, I'll jump in on your multi-use question. My my experience with offshore renewable energy is that the type of energy that's being deployed is is often driven by um, the incentives that government's giving for deployment of a particular device at any one moment in time. So, if you're looking, uh, as Remy was saying earlier, if if you're looking at um, fixed offshore wind, for example, they are only going to be building fixed off offshore wind because that's what their commercial incentives are driving them to do. Um, that's not to say that you couldn't then have other devices come along and, and use some of the things that they, they are, um, some of the installations in, in some way, but the developers will be very focused on that particular consent that they're trying to drive through, which is being driven by a commercial decision often by government incentives on, on the other, other side. So um, it's going to be quite secondary, I think, in the commercial decision-making, albeit operationally, you might be able to do it. Yeah, and I think um, at least at the European level, there I know there are now Horizon Europe projects uh, proposals out um, to look at, at placing, you know, floating solar in between wind, offshore wind, for instance. So, so that, those kind of things, I guess, from a research perspective is being pushed, but I don't know how much the industry would be keen to take that up. And then my second question, which eventually came back to me, thank goodness, uh, was really about, um, and it's it's sort of to Beth, you, you said that, you know, where there were reefs, there should be reefs again, but sometimes where there were reefs, there might not be the same reefs or the same species anymore because of climate change. So the, the push with changes in, in species distributions due to climate change might change. If we, you know, have we have we looked at how uh, putting structures in place in 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 the water that that could increase distribution or or, or um, biodiversity of species um, and how that would enhance or you know work in an invasive species way in a climate change context was that something that was highlighted in the document? Yes, there is some aspects about um, um, invasive species, but also the aspects of the fact that structures themselves and the extraction of energy will actually change the levels of mixing in, in the ocean. So an aspect that hasn't been looked at yet and is now being researched in the EcoWind projects here in the UK, and I know of, of some projects, of, of course, in the Southern North Sea as well, looking at the changes in mixing and that change to primary production and then on up through uh, the food chain. So more than just the structures themselves attracting things to live on them, the actual far field effects of the wind wake uh, from the extraction of energy and, and the uh, wakes and the turbulence created by the structures themselves. I, I think the oceanographic community for a long time, because most of the activity was in the Southern North Sea where it's very shallow, didn't think that, that the changes in mixing could have an effect, but actually some of them have been seen in real life there with changes in plankton production as an outcome. And so that's now uh, generated where we're going to have uh, both static and floating in deeper uh, places like over 50 meters, 60 meters, where we do have seasonal stratification. There is now a, a real look at, and it is mentioned in the document, but it's brand new um, in the sense that a lot of the research is, is just starting up now, although the modeling is, has been going for a while, showing that, that this is 
potentially important. We don't know if it's ecologically important, but it, it, it's certainly a definitely a change um, and needs to be investigated. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then I think we have, uh, oh, hold on, there's one more question that's coming. Uh, another question from Denis Lacroix saying, could it be possible to envision a comp compulsory set of sensors on a few posts of each of the um, Awari Park uh, to have data on the evolution of the coastal waters of Europe under climate change. Um, and this uh, EU initiative that uh, Felix mentioned could expand later uh, to, or maybe he meant this, the, in, this initiative he's talking about, could expand la uh, later to, the, to a world scale to improve the accur accuracy and reliability of marine environmental evolution assessment. Um, I personally think that's a great idea. <laughs> If anybody else would want to take that question, I'm not seeing hands raised. I think there was um, there was quite a lot of talk about um, in the document about the the need for ocean observations in general, and I think that's what he's building on there. So I think I think it would be great. I don't know. Um, I mean, you would need to have some some sort of legal requirement for that and that would come would need to come from policymakers i imagine that's why uh, i was staying quiet <laughs> <laughs> i think it is there as a recommendation and obviously it's a, a good idea in theory whether we could make it compulsory or not i think it's up to someone else to decide that but yeah but we um, could definitely recommend it very, very strongly so that that's good um, then we have two questions here uh, from, from Paula, uh, who, who can't put her questions in the Q&A because she's um, actually leading, she's, she's the one in charge of the, of the um, uh, Zoom. Uh, the first question she has is, um, why, is it, why do you think it was so important to have such a wide variety of perspectives and backgrounds in the document? Do you think having such a wide range of, uh, often when we do these documents, it's very natural science-y, but here we've actually had a, a broader perspective and do you think that's helped and do you think, uh, and if you do, why do you think it was good? Was good? Anybody? Is that too hard a question? <laughs> I, I can comment on it. I don't yeah. want to speak for anybody else, but from my perspective, you know, and, and this kind of touches upon my own career a little bit because I was an environmental scientist and then I did law. I went to work in an ocean energy center and they said, what are you doing here? You know, and I was trying to explain that, you know, you may have the most technically brilliant device, but unless it's economic and it's environmentally acceptable and acceptable by the local community, you're not going to get it in the water. And I think that really... Um, comes out on the, in the development of offshore energy, it, it needs to be viable from all sustainability perspectives. So you have to have that environment, economic and ecological. And I think there's a lot of areas where, you know, we're still very siloed. And if we want to progress, then there needs to be a more integrated approach. Yeah, I think so. And I think actually in, in, um, Certainly, in the marine board uh, perspective, from from for the last more than five years now, we've been pushing transdisciplinarity and making sure that we we don't do things in silos. So I think if it's something that's so important, um, the 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 social license to operate is not <laughs> is not a it's not a theoretical thing. It's something that a lot of a lot of people you know really come across if they don't if they don't take account of it. Um, and then the second question from Paula is, do you think that some countries are already further ahead than others in thinking about how they can holistically um, do marine spatial planning and, and how the offshore renewable energy development, um, you know, would fit into that, um, taking into account the other users of the environment and society? Are some countries just further ahead and better at, at doing that in Europe? Just a very, very difficult questions. That's very hard to answer <laughs> without making other people look bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like league, league tables, but I suppose from what we've seen in, in some instances, countries that have smaller maritime areas can do this more effectively. 
I don't know whether it's worthwhile reading into that or not, but that's that's definitely the case. And some some governance structures are just set up in a way that facilitates development uh, um, more efficiently. Maybe that's as far <laughs> as I'll go. <laughs> Well, I don't know, because I think some countries, even if they don't have a huge area, still could have very, um, very complex structures politically, and then it doesn't really help. So I think, uh, I think yeah. and that comes back to the um, ocean observations, the need for, for un understanding what's going on in the sea, you know, if you don't, if you don't know who's doing what, then, then you're not going to be able to, to enable that uh, very well. So I think the marine spatial planning um, directive and the, and the data and the, the plans that are required is something that will be um, will really help to make to make people understand how how offshore renewables fits in with the rest. Uh, Jill. Yeah, I, I have a question. So um, probably for um, everybody because I see on the on the uh, tech war uh, presentation that the term will. Uh, energy for the sea would be something quite relevant for the future. And um, uh, you say that it's not really uh, um, ready uh, now. And uh, I remember when I was uh, working uh, as a, a young scientist in Ephraimer in the beginning, and the, at the end of the 80s, uh, we were already having the thermal energy quite quite ready for the oceans, and I wonder if it's a policy problem or what that we are not able to deploy it, uh, especially I will say in the Pacific or other area where it will be relevant. So uh, that's always been a question for me: why we are so uh, slow in developing such uh, energy? And when I see the table. Of the of of the document, uh, I was a little bit surprised. So I don't know. Maybe the, someone can tell me what 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 we have to do, or if it's a political problem or financial problem or whatever. Yeah. So the question I think is about the thermal energy. I also saw that in the table when you when you put it on top for that. Actually, it looks like if you wanted bang for your buck, then that would be the best way to go because it hmm. seems like there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of um, capacity and whatever, but but somehow it's not being pushed. And and is that maybe what what Dickon was saying? It's really what's being pushed at a subsidy level. Is that the reason why it's not happening, or is there some technological problems that we don't understand that I don't understand? Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I can partially answer this question. Uh, first of all, uh, thermal energy is uh, is concentrated in uh, a very strict area around the. Uh, in the tropics, uh, because you need uh, to have a difference between the different water masses of 20 uh, degrees Celsius, 21 degrees Celsius. This is a large difference. You cannot find these differences in the Mediterranean or in other areas. So this is one reason. The second reason is that uh, uh, we don't know exactly the environmental impacts of this type of, uh, of using this energy. There are some pilot uh, projects uh, in Hawaii and in other places, but the environmental impacts are not well studied and uh, this is a hindrance for this development. Uh, from my side, uh, I can say this. I don't know if anyone else has an answer to the question. Uh, it doesn't look like anybody. Uh, then that anybody wants to answer, then there's one, I think probably we're getting to the end of our time there, Gilles, if I'm not mistaken, but there's one more question from uh, an anonymous attendee who's saying, um, if private industry and scientists continue to refuse to share data uh, for on offshore renewable energy, what would be other tools to gather data efficiently to assess envir the environmental impact? Um, I don't know. If, if anybody wants to have a go at that. And then Sergio, uh, who asked the question before, also um, suggests that we uh, divide offshore wind energy. Oops, hold on, he's gone away now. Somebody else had a question. Uh, hold on. Uh, we do divide offshore wind energy between floating and bottom fixed um, and uh, that we should also highlight green hydrogen 
um, to get a clarification of that in the report. Did we answer, did we deal with green hydrogen? I feel like we did mention it, but I'm not sure if we did. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Uh, Anne-Marie, you were, you were shaking your head there, so I was assuming that was the case. <laughs> I think it is in there as um, one of the technologies in chapter three. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we have uh, a question from Karen Dubsky um, saying, thank you, uh, Marine Board, uh, uh, super good work and uh, interesting Zoom question. How do we know whether we are keeping enough sandbank habitat? Um, if I was a thornback ray, I might want to keep my sand and gravel banks, not uh, extra reef. Um, I think that is a, a, is a really important question, especially for, um, you know, for the habitats directive, that's quite important. And the second question, is there a country with a uh, model ARIS convention, and then I'm just reading this, info and public participation where uh, when rolling out offshore wind? I don't really know what she means. One of which has all the industry industry license conditions available on land and set it out, uh, set out enforcement. Um, yeah, I don't really understand. I don't know if anybody else understands her question there. Um, but if uh, maybe we can take the sandbag question, <laughs> sandbank question at least, uh, that one made more sense to me. Well, well I'll, I'll just say that, that, was that was my point, point of not, not putting, putting in reefs where there weren't reefs before, that you've got to consider the rest of the species around. But um, OK, yeah, I'll pass over to Dickon <laughs> to answer the rest of the question. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to answer that question, actually. I was just looking at the, one of the other other questions um, about private industry and scientists continuing to refuse to share data. Um, I, I think it's important to note that all of all of the, the deployment of offshore wind is consented under EIA. And, and, and as such, they will have to share data with the regulators, whoever they may be. The, the, the challenge is sometimes getting them to share the raw data more widely um uh and 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 also to contribute to broader strategic monitoring initiatives which aren't targeted on the impacts that are set out within their consent um so i don't think there's necessarily um a problem with assessing environmental impact or at least i hope there isn't i hope the regulators have got a good grip of that the problem is is how you then share that data more broadly particularly in pre-application when the data is commercially sensitive um uh on on the the second point that karen raised about um uh model pu public participation and rolling out offshore wind i don't really know an answer to that other than to say look, look at the areas where offshore wind is mature um so uk germany denmark and 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 have a look at how it has been done in, in those areas um, is probably the best advice I give them. You're on mute, Sheila. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I will say uh, Paula has explained to me in the background what, what she thought it was meaning, and it was indeed about the empowering citizens to engage in public policy and in the rights for, for citizens to have a healthy environment. Um, so I guess that's, yeah, I mean, I understand the question, but you also have to think of it in a wider context. If you didn't have offshore renewables, you might have coal plants. So you might have to look at it. If you're looking at public health, then you have to look at the whole. You can't just look at the impact of one device or one type of technology. Um, so I think if I'm not mistaken, we've gone over time, Jill. I, I think that's correct. Yeah, you're correct. We are about three minutes over time. So I'm going so, to thank thank the the working group and uh, and 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 the, everybody who, who sent in questions. We will keep your questions that weren't answered and send them back to you. Send your answers um, afterwards, and I'll hand you back to Jill. Thanks, Jill. Okay, thank you to you, and thank you for for uh, the questions and 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 remarks and answers. Thank you, thank you to the working group. Uh, so we now reached the end of this web webinar. I think uh, it was quite quite interesting from what we were expecting, and especially from the discussion about the, this document. Uh, we have heard a, a lot of interesting points 
and uh, insightful discussion during the webinar. I would like to thank all the speakers. I would like to thank uh, our guests for, for the comments, uh, Felix uh, Linemann and, and Rémi Gruy. Again, uh, thank you to, 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 to all the group and especially to the chair and co-chair, so to Tag Tagvo and, and Anne-Marie. Uh, so I encourage uh, all the attendees, all the people to really download and read the documents and make advertising to, to, to their colleagues. Uh, it's uh, available on the, on the EMB website. Uh, please share it to, to the people, to the poli policymakers, to, to the stakeholders. I think they will find uh, some questions and answers. Uh, I hope the message and recommendation will be taken up, and uh, this is the, the 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 role of our documents, and uh, to use to to guide uh, uh, the all the, the the Europe, the stakeholder, and the direction of this sector needed to travel in. Uh, the development in the sector needs to be fast to meet the uh, outline target, uh, so. We, we cannot uh, delay in doing what is needed and all parties, which is science, policy, industry, have a role to play in, in bringing that to, 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 to the forefront and uh, take, it, take it. If you want to hear more about our activity as a European Marine Board, you have the, the, the last slide, which helps you to connect with the European Marine Board. We have a newsletter. I recommend, I think it's it's a very good newsletter. I, I, I congratulate the Secretary for doing probably one of the best newsletters I receive. It's not because I am the chair of the European Marine Board. I am a user, and I think it's a very good. And with all that, before I cough, I would like to thank you and say goodbye. <laughs> I got my 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 mic. Thank